Welcome to Macro Hype Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. We aim to help you use macro to invest in markets. To see our latest thoughts and analysis on the world, visit macrohive.com. My guest today is CMEK Moolemi. He's Professor of Business in the Decision, Risk and Operations Division of the Grad School of Business at Columbia University, where he's been since 2007. He also develops quantitative trading strategies at Burbaki LLC, a quant investment advisor. He was actually a high school dropout before going on to receive degrees at MIT, Cambridge and Stanford. So he's a very smart person. And in our conversation today, we'll be talking about the ins and outs of quant investing, whether machine learning works or not. And of course, we talk about some current markets such as Bitcoin as well. And this episode is sponsored by masterworks.io. The vast majority of bonds, 97%, in fact, are yielding less than 5% and savings accounts aren't any better. So you're lucky to scrape by with anything over a tenth of a percent. That's where masterworks.io comes in. They let you invest in multi-million dollar paintings by artists like Banksy, Basquet, and Cause. Personally, I have to say I love Banksy and Cause. And investing in this type of art helps you hedge against the markets. It can also outperform them, according to research from City Private Bank. Contemporary art returned 13.6% per year over the last 25 years, compared to 8.9% for the S&P 500. And contemporary art has the lowest correlation to all 10 major asset class since 1995. The problem is that most investment grade paintings cost upward of a million dollars, making the asset class reserved for the top 1%. But that's where masterworks.i comes in. They make art investing accessible to everyone, regardless of accreditation. And the best part, you don't need to know anything about art to invest. Their experts will create a custom portfolio to meet your investment needs. And you can also trade shares in their secondary market, similar to how you would trade shares in companies. In fact, they recently sold their first Banksy masterpiece for a 32% return net of fees after one year, nearly doubling the S&P over the same period. We partnered with masterworks.io to let our listeners skip their 15,000 person wait list. Just head to masterworks.io and use promo code HIVE, that's H-I-V-E, HIVE, to sign up and see important information at masterworks.io slash disclaimer. Okay, back to the show and a quick word on markets. Bond yields are shooting up and many are worried about an imminent equity correction. So we publish a bunch of pieces around this topic and on reflation more generally. We have articles on how rising yields tend to actually see higher stock markets, not lower. We have articles on whether a US infrastructure boom is already priced into markets. And we also have a piece on which countries have reached herd immunity. You can access all of this and more if you become a member at macrohive.com. Now to my conversation with CMEC. So welcome, CMAC, to our podcast show. I've been looking forward to having you on because your area of specialty is something I'm increasingly interested in. So it's good to hear from, a, from an expert directly. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And what I'd like to do with all my guests first is really to get a bit of their, a sense of their background. How did you end up in the area you're in right now on the academic side and in terms of the area of markets you focus on? Going to university, did, is this what you imagined you were going to do? <laughs> and, and you know, was this the path you were going to follow or what, what happened? Sure. So I guess it, it wasn't quite uh, perhaps the path I imagined I would follow. When I was an undergrad, I studied uh, math and computer science. And uh, the kind of math I liked was sort of math of a continuous flavor, things, you know, probability, if you will. And at some point, I realized that there were applications of this in finance and that you could earn a reasonable salary doing that. So I became sort of quite interested in that. And from uh, midway through my undergrad, I I went to MIT for undergrad, I started working at a hedge fund, which was located near the MIT campus and uh, ultimately became a partner there. So I did that for about, I don't remember quite exactly how long, but let's say five or six years. And we traded uh, fixed income relative value. Okay. And this is in the mid to late 90s. So it was quantitative in the sense that we were trading things like interest rate derivatives that required models to sort of analyze and to uh, hedge and to do portfolio construction and so on. But at some level, it was kind of discretionary also, like the old decision on whether to put on a trade and how to size it. And, and, and so on was ultimately uh, discretionary. And uh, sort of continued with that for a while. And it was sort of quite interesting. And then we, we hit the LTCM crisis in, in 98. And we weren't doing quite all the things long-term capital management was doing, but we had some overlap. And, you know, that was that was sort of a challenging time. And, you know, at, at that time, I sort of became sort of quite disillusioned with our trading strategy in, in, in the sense that, you know, I, I realized a lot of it was based on the assumption, for example, 
that we could sort of consistently fund our positions and we could use okay. leverage to try and exploit, you know, mispricings and, and, and turn them into sort of a, a real paychecks. And that turned out not to be sort of a good assumption. So I did some other things for a while. I, I went to work at a biotech startup doing computer modeling. At some point, I, I thought it'd be good to be a, a professor. Um, turns out you need this PhD thing. So I went <laughs> off. To, I did a PhD at Stanford. And yeah. uh, after that, I moved to Columbia as a faculty member. Now, in terms of my research, I work on sort of two things. One is I'm interested in problems where there, you're making decisions over time and there's uncertainty. And so okay. this goes under the rubric of um, stochastic control or dynamic programming or you know various uh, various different names. I'm also quite interested in applications. And the main applications I think about are in finance, namely things like quantitative trading, high frequency trading, market microstructure. These days, cryptocurrencies have sort of these tools can be applied in really interesting ways. So, so that's, that's sort of mainly what I do now. I guess in addition to my Columbia stuff, I'm also a, a, a principal in a small quantitative trading firm called uh, Borbaki LLC, um, uh, where we apply uh, some of these ideas, uh, you know, to sort of uh, you know, try and uh, deliver superior, you know, risk adjustments. And uh, so, so I, I like to drink the Kool-Aid, if you will, or, or, or practice what I preach. Uh, of interest, how do you find having an academic career at the same time as being a practitioner? Because that's, it's quite unusual. Often there's a bit of a separation or, you know, people move from academia to a fund or something and they stay on, on one side or the other. Or... I think there's pros and cons to both worlds. It's not that one dominates the other. I think if you do it the right way, there's a lot of synergies. Obviously, my work as a practitioner benefits from my insights as an academic because I'm yeah. working on similar problems. But you know, oftentimes, even more interesting is the other way because I, I sort of feel a lot of the applied problems I think about are really quite recent and have to do with you know broader shifts towards computerization of markets and so on. And working as a practitioner, it really sort of gives you insight to identifying problems that academics don't even know about. And yeah. also, you know, I think another other challenge with academics, you know, sort of similarly, you, you end up thinking you're working on a practical problem, but maybe it's actually not really like something anyone cares about. Or also maybe kind of the assumptions you're making aren't focused on sort of the first order drivers of, you know, of outcomes and so on. So I think the practitioner side grounds me in reality. Okay, no, that's good to hear. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned on the academic side that you focus on loosely sort of quantitative finance, quantitative investing. And you mentioned earlier in the mid to late 90s, you know, you were looking at quantitative finance back then. And quantitative finance means different things to different people. So in one era of financial history, it was more to do with relative value and things like that. And today, it's more to do with systematic strategies. And, and more specifically, it's increasingly associated with artificial intelligence and machine learning. So in your mind, how do you define quantitative investing or finance? Yeah, so I think you, you hit on you know a bunch of the important points. I probably in the '90s would have called what I was doing quantitative invest, but I wouldn't wouldn't call it now because it's there's a significant discretionary component. So I think like you know um, fixed income relative value, volatility trading, you know, so on. People you know use a lot of math and computational tools, but at the end of the day, it's it's sort of a human pulling the trigger. I yeah. think the way I would describe quantitative trading now, and and certainly my primary interests now are around systematic quantitative trading, where you know the you know minute to minute decisions are made by the computer and the role of a portfolio manager is you know merely to sort of do research and to set up the models in advance not exercising any kind of day-to-day -day, uh, discretion now within that realm of systematic quantitative strategy i also think there is a further division and people have different sort of words for this also I'll sort of use my words i think on the one hand, there's sort of a quantitative investing that's driven by predictions. You're looking at the state of the world, you're looking at data, you have whatever features you want. And sort of based on these features, you're going to buy an asset right now because you think the price is going to go up, right? Or sell it if you think the price is going to go down, right? So really, it's your, you have some kind of prediction of what's going to happen in the future, be it, you know, in a high frequency context, maybe five minutes from now, or in, in a startup context, maybe two weeks from now, or, you know, some horizon, right? I contrast that to, let's say, and quantitative strategies that are more driven by the idea of earning a risk premium, right? So the idea that maybe there's some factor you'd like exposure to, because over a very long time horizon, you're going to, you know, earn a risk premium for that uh, factor. So people apply quantitative methods there as well, you know, and, you know, sometimes people describe this uh, dichotomy as difference between active trading being sort of the predictive prediction driven side or passive trading being sort of the more risk premium side. You know, you, you can use sort of different words for it. I'm mainly focused on the other uh, former. 
So quantitative trading where you have, you know, conditional views that are constantly being adjusted over time and you're trying to position a portfolio to, uh, to sort of take advantage of that. Going to your other questions to artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence, machine learning, statistics, in my mind, a lot of them are, you know, a lot of the, the same kind of core ideas may be developed by sort of slightly different communities. I think when people talk about AI or, or, or machine learning in sort of more recent times, they're very focused on particular domains where there's been really kind of a phase transition. And the domains I'm thinking about are things like, you know, computer vision, like, you know, recognizing, you know, faces or coffee cups or whatever in an yeah. image, uh, natural language processing, certain types of games, like, for example, playing chess or Go or so on. And I think in, in, in those domains, there have been specific techniques surrounded, associated with names like deep learning, reinforcement learning, or so on, that have really created like sort of a phase transition, right? Where, yeah. you know, sort of the, the kind of stuff you can do in the computer vision world now, you simply couldn't do like 10 years ago, certainly not the 20 years ago. In, in quantitative trading, I think it's uh, much more evolutionary. So first of all, I think there have been very sophisticated mathematical thinkers in these markets for a long time. Some of the most successful people today, for example, you know, a renaissance, they've been doing it for, you know, 40 years or, you know, sort of a however long. I think a lot of, you know, perhaps these ideas like deep learning and reinforcement learning are entering into the space as well. But I think it's a little bit less of a, a phase transition and yeah. a little bit more uh, evolutionary, you know, in terms of uh, being more incremental to sort of the kind of things people have been doing before. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a very good point. I mean, I speak to lots of investors all the time, and especially people who are non-quantitative keep saying, okay, we're going to just introduce this machine learning technique, and then our returns are going to like be turbocharged, Google's doing it. And when you scratch away the surface, you realize it's a lot more complicated. You know, what you can do with image recognition is very different from when you're dealing with a time series. So I, I guess maybe let's kind of go a bit more deeper into this. You know, I, I guess one way people frame problems to solve using machine learning is the issue of, I guess, categorization versus regression. You know, one way to look at this, is this an apple or not, you know, is kind of one problem to solve versus I'm trying to sort of predict a time series, you know, which has different statistical properties. I mean, my perspective is those problems aren't fundamentally different in the sense okay. that uh, both are you know, examples of supervised learning, where, for example, you know, the, the way you would train either to predict the stock price tomorrow or, you know, is an apple or not, you'd have a bunch of examples where you see the data and you see what the right answer is, i.e., is it an apple or not? What was the actual return from today to tomorrow? So on. And you try to build a model that is, is able to predict the latter from the former. Now, there's specific technical details and th these things are done differently. For example, if you're trying to predict if something is an apple or not, you would not use um, linear regression. There's mm -hmm. something called logistic regression, which is sort of a small modification of linear regression, which is, you know, sort of oriented toward that, you know, type of a yes, no question. So okay. I think there are small technical differences, but I don't think it's anything fundamental. Okay, no, that's, that's good to know. And then in, in terms of you, you mentioned earlier that you know, we've seen these phase transitions in your kind of revolutions in certain areas, and it's more of evolution in finance. Why is that? Why haven't we seen this revolution in or this phase transition in finance? Issue with certain things like, let, let's take image recognition for an example. At some level for humans, image recognition is an easy problem, right? Like if you're looking at a picture and you want to ask the question, you know, is there a coffee cup in this picture? That is a very easy question to answer. You and I would both look at it and come up with the same answer. A two-year-old child could sort of answer that question and so on. So at some level there, for humans, there's easy problems. There are easy problems. And the challenge for computers was we just didn't have good representations for, let's say, the world of all natural images that could possibly occur, right? So we, we don't have good representations to understand what's in an image. And so phrased differently, that type of image recognition problem is a sort of a high signal to noise regime. Once okay. you have the right representation, it's, it's, it's sort of very easy and the answer isn't uh, controversial, right? So I, my feeling is in, in, in finance, we actually do have much better representations, right? So, you know, I'm thinking about ideas such as CAPM and factor models and, and, and so on. Not sort of picking any of these particular ideas, but just these things have been studied for, you know, many years. And we do have, whether any of these models is correct or not, we have a lot of intuition for how prices should behave, number one. So I don't think we have the issue of sort of finding the right representation, if you will. Number two, the regime is completely the opposite and you're, and you're in this very low signal to noise regime because at the end of the day, the markets are largely efficient. It's a sort of self-correcting mechanism where people identify anomalies, they trade on them, the anomalies are arbed out of the market. So you have really, really, really small levels 
levels of signal that you're sort of trying to find in a sea of noise. So in, in some level, it, it's a little bit of a different problem. Now, I don't mean to diminish those the, the accomplishments in areas like computer vision. I mean, those are obvious, incredible methods and more power to those people. And also, I don't mean to say that the ideas like deep learning and reinforcement learning don't have a place in, in finance. But I think our starting point was way different. Right. Even before the introduction of some of these techniques, you know, lots of people um, were, were, had sort of quite sophisticated financial models, whereas the, the, the computer vision world, you're sort of, what's the phrase, in the land of the blind where the man with one eye is king, right? So if you're starting from a point where you can't even do basic things, uh, all of a sudden, you know, being able to recognize a coffee cup in a picture seems amazing, even though at some level, it's not a hard problem. Yeah, yeah, understood. Okay, that makes sense. And so if we kind of talk a bit more about the toolkit that you think is appropriate for financial markets, I imagine most listeners to this podcast are familiar with sort of linear regressions, even logistical regressions, probit regressions, kind of the statistical econometrics world. You know, a lot of people probably did courses in that at school and, and use it in their day-to-day jobs. And you know, they may use principal component analysis and you know, kind of all the stuff you use in kind of the econometrics world. So obviously that's, that's one way of making predictions. Now, what do some of the machine learning techniques bring to the table that you can't do in econometrics? So I think, you know, linear regression has a lot of nice properties. It has nice computational properties, it has nice sort of theoretical properties. You get things like confidence intervals and p-values. And, you know, some of these things are maybe a little controversial and you have to make some <laughs> yeah. assumptions, but it, it gives you a lot of structural insight, right? Linear regression is kind of accomplishing two things, right? You know, it's accomplishing, number one, it's making predictions. Number two, it's t- giving you information, for example, about what variables are more yeah. or less important than others and what variables are statistically significant. What is the direction of the relationship between between a particular X variable and the outcome you're looking at and so on, right? The machine learning world, you sort of throw out all that second part. You say, I don't care about why the prediction is coming from. I just want to sort of focus on making very accurate predictions, right? And so there's more techniques that are available. They are not reliant on having linear relationships. And, you know, many relationships are indeed not linear, or perhaps it's uh, difficult to identify how to come up with features so that they become linear. And so you, you sort of uh, gain a lot more flexibility. But that said, I think, you know, if, if you had to give me one predictive tool, linear regression would be the one I pick. I think in general, in this quantitative area these days, you know, you have to, if you, if you want to be competitive, you have to innovate. And I think people try to innovate in, uh, in, in two ways. One might be along the lines of what we're talking about, which is to apply more black box machine yeah. learning type of methods to identify maybe more complicated relationships that are, you know, do not fit in a uh, linear form. The other might be to leverage data that has not been used in the past. So for example, probably most people in the past in this sort of systematic uh, quantitative space really have been using technical data, things like prices and trades and volumes and, you know, sort of things like that. Well, you know, um, there's this whole world of alternative data, whether it's, you know, sort of leveraging satellite images of parking lots to sort of understand how a retail stock is going to do, or use looking at credit card data or natural language processing of news and so on. So I think there's another area where people yeah. try to innovate, which is to sort of get data, which gives a competitive advantage. And if you have you know, sort of unique data, you, you may not need any of this uh, fancy machine learning. Yeah. So your regression may work just fine, right? Well, on the other hand, if you're, if you're going to try to work with data that other people have, then in order to sort of have an edge and I- identify something novel, you're going to have to sort of try things that are beyond the first thing that everyone else would try. Yeah. And so, well, I'll come back to you on, on the data point, but in terms of the techniques, obviously there's a, there's a range of machine learning sort of techniques, you know, neural networks, forests, you know, decision trees type approaches, deep learning, ensemble type models, and all, all of these sorts of things. I mean, what do you generally think, if you do want to set up a kind of a machine learning based quantitative process, what are the techniques that you think are fairly reliable to kind of work in financial markets? And then which techniques do you think are at this stage, it's unclear how useful they are? I honestly don't have a good answer to that. It's very sort of case specific. I would, in general, my philosophy would be to sort of try with the most basic stuff first, like just even linear regression, and then build sort of on top of that. I mean, at a high level, you know, these things have different kinds of trade-offs, you know, things like neural networks are, I think, are pretty good at capturing, you know, sort of very nonlinear relationships. Things like decision tree-based methods are very good at the sort of dealing with lots of variables and sort of getting rid of the sort of feature selection problem. I think there's pros and cons to all of these. I I don't think there is a unique answer. I think the answer is you got to try it. 
Yeah. And, you know, one issue I guess people find with some of these techniques is what you talked about earlier, which is that you don't really know the why. You know, it, it is a black box. How much of an issue is that for you? Because I mean, some like me, I, yeah, I like to know why the model is, is doing what it's doing. And so I feel very uncomfortable when I'm confronted with a sort of a black box. So how do you go about dealing with that issue if you do think it's an issue maybe it's not an issue right so i would sort of lift it up a little bit i think yeah. the biggest first order issue in making predictions of you know future returns is overfitting yeah. you're in this regime where the the signal is, is sort of very weak the market is largely efficient and from the perspective of mathematical modeling that means that you know future prices are a little bit of signal and a lot of random noise right and when you fit models on historical data, what you need to avoid is fitting to the random noise because then yeah. when you roll out that model in production, it's, uh, it, it, it's not going to work. Now, one sort of heuristic that people often use to sort of avoid overfitting is to try and see, like, try and ask the question, does this make sense? right? Can I come up with a story like, okay, the model is, is sort of coming up with this predictions, but you know, maybe if I'm doing something like linear regression, I understand what those variables are. I can point at a certain structural supply demand yeah. imbalance, which is creating this anomaly and so on. So, so that's one mechanism to avoid uh, overfitting. And certainly I think if you can come up with an explanation, if you, you have a structural understanding of where those predictions are coming from, that's fantastic. On the other hand, there's probably many anomalies out there where what's really going on under the surface is either not visible or just so complex. You know, there, there may not be a clean story, right? And by sort of requiring a sort of structural understanding, you're kind of putting yourself at a, a competitive disadvantage to, to others who don't care. Right. Because okay. at the end of the day, like if you buy an asset, the price goes up and, and then you sell it, you have made money in advance. You have to know why it's going to go up. Well, you know, as, as long as it consistently goes up and you're, you're, not, you're not overfitting, you know, I would argue that that's fine. So I think the universe of anomalies that, you know, it's possible to come up with an explanation of is much smaller than the, the universe of anomalies that may exist in my mind. So if you're in the black box world, on the other hand, now you have to sort of think about other ways to address that challenge of overfitting. Right. So yeah. there, I think you want to start to be really careful about having a discipline in your research, really careful about ideas, about having a separate training sets and validation sets and test sets and so on. Really careful about the, how often you go out of sample and you want to try to use other techniques to sort of manage overfitting. Okay. Yeah. I mean, one thing I have found in this field is a lot of people's out of sample becomes in sample very quickly for them. You know, I guess that's where the discipline comes. You have to be honest with yourself and your process rather than trying to you know, contaminate your different sample periods. That's right. And I think, you know, my impression is that the best successful people are very, very careful about having a research process in place that, you know, has that kind of discipline. Yeah. And you mentioned data earlier. And, you know, when you're using data, obviously, there's lots of considerations, especially in the alternative data space in terms of one, quality of the data. Second, you know, do you, how much work do you need to do on the data? You know, whether there's lots of noise in the data, is it seasonally adjusted, not seasonally adjusted? You know, what, what are you capturing exactly? What, what are the types of considerations you use when you come across like an alternative data set? I think the, the type of things I would think about when evaluating a, an alternative data set are things like things like what you said, like, so for example, maybe how clean is the data? Other things like maybe how applicable is the data? Like, so for example, I briefly mentioned before this sort of satellite image yeah. that people take of, you know, parking lots and stuff. Well, you know, that works for a certain class of large retailers like, you know, Walmart and Costco and, you know, so on, right? So if you're going to invest all this money and all this modeling effort in some data, but you're only going to make predictions for you know, 50 names out of a, you know, universe of 5,000 names or sort of something like that, then you got to sort of trade that off. I think another thing is to sort of think about how unique that data is and how many other people have it, right? Because if it's sort of truly sort of unique data where you're the, the only one that has it, that's that's obviously uh, worth more. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And in terms of, you often hear the term big data, you know, and when I think of big data, I think of, okay, big data for me would be something that you can't really use Excel for, <laughs> you know, that's what I, in, in a very sort of simple heuristic, how do you think about sort of big data? I mean, because you hear that term bandied around everywhere. And are there specific challenges with using such large data sets? So, I mean, I, I do use Excel, but not really for sort of quantitative modeling. Okay. I think, you know, certainly any data I'm going to work with in this, in this context, you're sort of beyond Excel. 
I think there is a practical, there's a couple of markers that, you know, make, make the data sets uh, sort of harder to work with. So one is if your data does not fit into memory. Many algorithms that work very well, if you can fit all your examples into sort of uh, memory historical examples. But once you sort of uh, exceed that, it's, it's sort of not clear how to proceed. The related kind of issue of when the, the data gets big enough so that to analyze it, you need to use more than one CPU and indeed even maybe more than one separate computer. The worst case would be data that's so large that you have to store it on disk. For the, for the processing, you have to use many cores across many different machines. And that creates kind of engineering challenges. So for example, you know, just to go, go back to the methodologies, one nice thing about neural networks is on the engineering side, you can work with systems like that. You know, um, neural networks are, you know, I'm trained under the hood with a set of algorithms, things called, you know, like stochastic gradient descent, and they're easy to parallelize. They're easy to, you know, work with, with larger data sets and, you know, so on. Contrast that with something like trees. There, you know, it's really sort of more oriented towards data sets that you, where you can sort of fit everything into memory and work on uh, um, a one computer and so on. Yeah, okay, understood. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned kind of the engineering challenges because what one thing I do find in in the quantitative space the kind of the practical side of it becomes very important, you know, how you set up your CPUs or servers and so on and and also how you manage your data kind of the data engineering side also seems to become very important too. It's not very glamorous, yeah. You know, I was speaking to a friend of mine who works in machine learning at one of the big tech companies is that what he values a lot are people who work in statistical offices you know, because they really understand the noise in the data and how to manage the data itself. Because obviously, if you, if you have a bad data set, then it doesn't matter what you do on top of it. But it's not glamorous. It's not the most glamorous end of the market. And, you know, moving on then to a more kind of general point, you know, when you do have various models that you think deliver alpha of some kind, how do you think about a portfolio construction or combining models together? Good. So I think this you're sort of bringing up a very important topic, but maybe before I sort of dive into that, I can you know give a little bit of a higher level view because I'm not sure everyone understands this type of approach you're alluding to. So I think there's two broad approaches to developing quantitative trading strategies. One, which is I'll call the end-to-end -end approach, which is you sort of identify some data or some market feature or something that maybe has predictive value. And then basically what you optimize is you optimize a strategy directly on top of that. So for example, you, 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 know, you may have this variable you've identified, you set up stops around around it, you know, set up levels at which you're going to get into the trade and how much and so on. And you optimize all this with backtesting. And I call that end to end because you're starting with the relevant information and the, the way you're measuring whether you do well or not and you know, figure out how to adjust your parameters and so on is, is really looking at your objective being investment performance, right? It's ultimately the other thing you care about. So let's take, that's the end to end approach. The, the decomposition approach, you try to split it into you know, some sub problems, which are a little bit more manageable, right? And I think this is what you were alluding to. So first step in the decomposition approach would be let's make predictions, right? We're buying because the thing is going to go up. We're selling because we think the price is going to go down. So let's build predictive models of what's going to happen in the future. And the output may be predictions of, you know, relevant things. So for example, what's the return going to be? Uh, maybe, you know, to a to fixed horizon, maybe a whole trajectory, also things like uh, volatility and so on. And so you, you get a bunch of predictive outcomes and that gets fed into the next step, which is portfolio construction, right? So portfolio yeah. construction would be, let's set up an optimization problem where we optimize a portfolio, which is going to be well-placed to take advantage of these predictions if they do indeed occur, right? If, if you know, reality ends up, if those predictions are realized, right? Whilst controlling for risk so that uh, we don't lose too much if they don't occur and, you know, position limits and, you know, leverage yeah. limits and, you know, all, all, all the kinds of constraints you want. And then there's a, a third step, which is, okay, this is the target portfolio. Now, what do I actually do? right? How do I trade it? Should I um, go to a broker and put in a VWAP order? Or should I go on the markets and take liquidity? Or, you know, should I trade in a dark pool? You know, sort of what should I do? And the, the sort of the interface between the, the last two components of portfolio construction and the execution is really something like a cost function or a price impact function. Because when you're building your portfolio, you have to anticipate how much it's going to cost to realize this portfolio. Even if the price is going to go up a lot, it's going to cost even more to get into that trade. It's, you know, obviously uh, you don't want to do it. So again, two 
two approaches, this sort of end-to-end -end approach where you sort of do everything in one shot and this decomposition approach where you, uh, you break it into steps. They have their pros and cons, right? The end-to-end -end approach, again, the nice thing is the ultimate objective, the, the way you're, you're sort of fitting your models and uh, measuring if you're doing well is your investment performance, like, you know, risk-adjusted return or a sharp ratio or sort of something like that. And that's your ultimate goal, right? Now, the, the, the downsides of the end-to-end -end approach is it's not scalable. Right. So you yeah. have one sort of giant hairball of a, of a strategy. Yeah. If you, you know, if let's say you come up with an idea for, you know, another source of alpha, how do you add that in? You have to sort of optimize, re-optimize the whole thing. Also tends to be less data efficient. Right. So I mentioned before a number one sort of issue with uh, quantitative trading is overfitting. Right. When you optimize in back tests, it's kind of like you have a bunch of samples of what's happened in the past. And because you're looking at your PL, those samples aren't equally weighted. They're kind of weighted by your trade size. You know, you yeah. might have had some strategy in the past. And if you like, let's say you run a, you know, a five year back test and you look at its performance, that might be dominated by a relatively small fraction of the time where you put on large trades. Right. So at some level, like you're, you're not caring it's, so much about those other instances. And that basically means you kind of have less data. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not a like for like, so that back test isn't actually a true back test then. Well, it's just less data efficient versus, so, so let's take the other approach. The other approach, if I'm fitting a model, I'm going to focus on predictions, right? So there, I, and there, there might be instances in time where my uh, prediction is small and in a back test, I wouldn't have gotten into a trade, but you know, if I look at, okay, my prediction is that, you know, this price, this you know, stock is going to move zero basis points. If indeed it moves zero basis points, then I should use that as extra evidence that my model is good, right? And so having this, this sort of decomposition approach uses the data better. It's also more scalable in the sense of, you know, I think, you know, an, another broad phenomenon is, you know, is this is a very competitive space, right? Many people, many smart people um, uh, with a lot of resources are, are out there. And these anomalies um, that one typically finds are, are, are sort of very small. So maybe you have one anomaly you identified using this data set of satellite data. You may have another uh, anomaly you identified using some other data set, you know, some anomaly using some machine learning method, right? You want to do, what you want to do is you want to kind of add these up and trade when all these signals are aligned in the same direction. And, you know, maybe any single one of these signals, you wouldn't exceed transaction costs, right? But if you, if you now have a dozen signals and uh, seven of them are saying the price is going up and you sort of add them up, then, you know, now you're exceeding transaction costs. So, so yeah. in that way, there's a little bit of uh, increasing returns to scale. Anytime you put on a trade, you have this transaction cost you have to pay back. First signal might not get you there, but as you add, you know, more of them together, yeah. Right. Once you're above transaction costs, if you come up with, you know, another signal, then that's free money. Right. Because yeah. you've already, you know, paid the fixed cost of uh, getting into the trade. So, you know, having a uh, the, the decomposition approach, you know, if, if you're a, a large firm, you know, you can have a whole bunch of researchers working on alpha. And they can be working mm. on very different alphas with different data sets and different techniques and so on. And you can sort of try to coherently combine them and have a strategy which basically more effectively monetizes any single one because it trades when these things are aligned. Right. So that creates a, a number of interesting issues. The, the first one of which you, you brought up, which I think challenges for practitioners, I think are very under, poorly understood academically. Like I can't think of papers which address this. And so, so one is, is this challenge of uh, alpha mixing. So I have dozens of different alphas. You know, again, people may vary, but I've heard that large quantitative firms that you might think about may have tens to, to even thousands of different individual types of alphas. How do you combine them into sort of a one coherent view of yeah. the market? right? There's challenges there. Another challenge is if you have teams working on different kinds of alphas, how do you coordinate them in the specifically with respect to the issue of managing correlation, right? So if I have one alpha that let's say is a momentum alpha and I have some other alpha, which is let's say this alpha based on analysis of parking lots, just, you know, hypothetically, they're 90% correlated. You know, th this new thing I discovered is useless. Basically uncovering the same anomaly like I sort of found before, right? So in this way, you want to sort of try and think about setting up your work in a way that uh, when you're doing your, your research, you want to find sort of new alpha that's sort of uncorrelated to sort of the things you know before. And sometimes that's a challenge because, you know, maybe the things that are easiest to discover are already the things of, uh, you, you've sort of found. So I think there's, there's a couple of challenges there. There's also, I think, interesting implications in terms of the competitive landscape, right? This idea that there's increasing returns to scale because of needing to exceed this fixed cost, this idea that you're going to need many sources of alpha and that you're going to combine them, this sort of really favors firms which are structured to have a handful of trading strategies, but with many people working on them. For example, you know, from like Two Sigma, 
Right? Two Sigma yeah. has a handful of trading strategies, and with each of those uh, trading strategies, they might have, you know, I don't know how many, but probably dozens of people working on alpha, you know, another set of people working on portfolio optimization yeah. and so on, right? Renaissance famously is, is you know, again, start structured around a handful of trading strategies, you know, and so on. I contrast that with places which are more like the pod shops, right? Yeah. Where you have completely independent PMs, sort of, you know, maybe a team of one or, you know, two or three, each doing their own thing, not coordinating in terms of combining their alphas to sort of unlock some synergies, not coordinating in terms of managing correlation. Maybe you have a dozen different odd PMs, but you know, if, if they're all 90% correlated, might as well just take the first and give him, you know, have him do 10 extra positions. So I think there's interesting sort of structural issues in terms of what kind of um, competitive model will be more successful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And how do you think about time horizons of models? You know, because you could have you know, models which work at say the one minute level or five minute level, or you could have a model that works at two weeks or at two months or at maybe even two years. Is time horizon something that would lead you to differentiate the way you treat those models or do you just view them similarly? No, you need to treat things with different time horizons differently. So let me get, let me give you an example. So a, a common sort of a predictive thing is uh, something called order book imbalance. This is well studied. You can read papers about it, right? Basically, if you look at the limit order book for an asset, and there's more buy orders and sell orders, probably the price is going to go up. Everybody knows this, the effect is weak, you're not going to make back your transaction costs. But you know, again, in combination with all these other things, there, there might be, you know, that might be one more alpha you throw in. Now, something like order book imbalance is realized very quickly, like, you know, maybe a minute, if not less, right. And um, let's contrast that with, let's say you have another alpha, let's say based on this, this parking lot thing, you know, my example, right, you may have a model of, you know, floor traffic at Walmart, and you may be able to sort of make a accurate prediction of how Walmart is doing. How long is that, you know, your prediction going to be taken to realize into data? It might not be till the next earnings event, right? When yeah. Walmart actually reveals how they're doing and you were right, right? You have one alpha that's realized over a minute, one alpha that might be realized, let's say over two months. And so if, if I just add those two and say my composite prediction over the next two months is the sum of the first one and the second one, what that misses is the first alpha. I have to trade on that right now. I don't trade on that right now. Like, you know, 10 seconds from now, it'll be gone. So yeah, I need to yeah. be very aggressive about a, a high frequency alpha, right? Yeah. On the other hand, you know, something that's two months, I can be very slow into getting into that trade. And indeed, maybe I should because I, I'll, I'll get into it more cheaply if I trade slowly. So yeah. you, you can't just sort of naively combine these, you have to do things like maybe more think about trajectories. And so when you when we think about time horizon, so, so that's one angle, which is that a lot of these different anomalies or alphas, if you will, they have their own intrinsic time horizon. There's some underlying phenomena and it's, it takes a certain amount of time to get uh, realized into the price. And now the, the second thing is that the assets you trade also have their own intrinsic time horizon, right? And this is a function of things like, let's say volatility and liquidity and your risk aversion and, 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 and so on. But let me, let me focus on one of those because I think yeah. it's most clear that, you know, like, let's say the liquidity, like, let's say you're trading US equities and let's say you're trading, you know, sort of, I don't know, um, an S&P 500. Like, let's say the top 500 large cap US yeah. equities. If you look at the trading costs for, for number one, right? They're significantly smaller than the trading costs for number 500 simply because, you know, it's, it's more liquid. And the time horizon you should care about on the trading side has to do with the liquidity. At an extreme, if there were no transaction costs, if it was free to trade an asset, your time horizon should be, you know, very small, almost instant, right? Because yeah. uh, if you think over the next instant in time, it's going to go up, you should buy. And then you'll revisit that because you can sell later and it's just going to cost you nothing. So if yeah. there's no cost to sort of getting in and out, your time horizon should be very short, right? On yeah, the yeah. other hand, if an asset is less liquid, right? If there is a significant cost to getting in and out, now you're going to start to care about making a prediction at a longer horizon, right? Because, uh, you know, it costs money to uh, sort of get in and get out. And so even if you're like, let's say in a restrictive world of, I don't know, let's say top 3000 US equities, then the intr intrinsic time horizon for something very liquid there versus something very illiquid might be different by an order of magnitude. You yeah. want to trade them in a consistent, coherent way, right? It does not make sense to use a trade Apple and have a typical hold time of two weeks and you know also do that with a with a much less liquid stock given that it's very cheap to get you know get in and out of apple with in, in large size right so i think it's, this is most extreme in equities which is mainly my expertise but the assets also have an intrinsic time horizon so i think both from the predictive side and on on, on the trading side you really want to think about it not in terms of uh, okay i'm going to focus on what's going to happen in the next two weeks but you really want to think about it as a trajectory right like what's the, what not just what's the end point but what's the path and it's interesting math mathematically sort of thinking about, you know, how to do that.
Yeah, absolutely. And so if you step back and you look at the financial or the investment community today, I mean, what do you see as some of the key trends that are emerging in the quantitative investment space? So I think we've sort of, I think, touched on one of them, which I think there are these increasing returns to scale that we see in other technology businesses, you know, like in the high tech sector as well, which I think creates incentives for winner take all dynamics, where you'll have a handful of large firms who are very successful at the expense of others. In the, the, the quantitative trading space, you know, again, people are very secretive about their you know returns and their investment flows and so on. So it's, it's sort of hard to say, but I think you can see this more, more clearly in the high frequency space where, you know, I'm, I'm not a high frequency trader, but and I don't have special information, but, you know, my understanding is basically Citadel is crushing everyone. Right. And, and, you know, basically Citadel securities is, you know, taking, you know, just to make up a number, 70, 80% of the, the profits in that space. And, you know, again, I think it's because there's increasing returns to scale to sort of combining these various ideas. So, so one phenomenon I think is we're going to see is a consolidation and, you know, sort of winner take all dynamics. The same way, you know, Google crushes everyone else in, uh, in, in search, right? You know, I think another phenomenon we're going to see is larger reliance on uh, computation. And I think this is something already we see in the uh, the more traditional AI world, in this world of computer vision and playing chess and you know so on. In that sort of uh, AI world, there is now a paradigm where look, you know, if you have good ideas and you can be clever and so on, that's great. But another way to achieve superior um, uh, performance is simply to throw a lot of compute at a problem, right? And so the numbers are, are, are really kind of stunning. So if you look at DeepMind, which is a, a unit of Google that does a lot of this stuff, for example, famous for their computer players for chess and, and Go and so on, and you try to replicate one of their papers, for example, their paper where they train, let's say, Alpha Zero, which is a neural network player for some of these games. Forget about doing the research and trying different ideas. If you just wanted to implement the final system they, uh, they came up with, but you didn't have access to Google's resources and you had, you know, buy compute time on AWS, or whatever, it would cost, you know, 20, $30 million, right? So, you know, an, an enormous sums of money being invested in computation. You know, again, I don't have uh, special information, but I've heard it speculated that, you know, Google, which perhaps owns the largest computational infrastructure on the planet, you know, data centers everywhere, lots of computers. What do they do with all those computers? Is it doing search? Is it serving ads? You know, so on. I've heard that their number one workload is actually training machine learning models. Right. And so I think you're going to start to see that in finance as well. So um, I heard an anecdote about uh, one large hedge fund, which you know we're all familiar with, but I won't name, where you know, sort of typical quant alpha researcher is allocated uh, um, 10,000 processors. Right. So they have a sort of running budget of 10,000 processors to run various types of back tests and do a grid sweep over parameters and try different data sets, you know, so, sort of whatever you want. So I think an another major trend is we're going to start to see this coming in where people try to, you know, again, you know, sort of if you can get away without all that CPU, that's great. But let, if you can get an edge by like buying computer time and, you know, your, you know, Renaissance technologies and you have a ton of money, that's a no brainer. You're, you're going to buy a lot of computing time. So again, I think that will sort of feed into a more, more consolidation because because not so many people can afford that. So where, where does that leave boutiques then? I mean, is there a role then for boutiques or smaller funds then? I think you got to find a niche where, uh, you know, you're sort of uh, doing something different that may be uh, unattractive to people. Oftentimes people think of it in terms of things like capacity versus, you know, let's say sharp ratio, right? So maybe, you know, there, there might be strategies where you can sort of do very well, but are very sort of capacity limited. And so just to make up, you know, a number might make, you know, $10 million a year, right? Well, if you're like Renaissance Technologies, that's probably not going to move the needle, right? It's, you know, not going to register or for Jim Simons to make $10 million a year, right? Versus if you're, you're like an individual, that might be a fantastic amount of money, right? So there, there might be niches where uh, are, are not interesting to these bigger players where, you know, sort of smaller people can have an advantage. Yeah, understood. And at the top of our conversation, you mentioned you had some interest or you had some interest in Bitcoin or some focus on Bitcoin. I mean, how do you kind of view that? I mean, it sounds like you think that it lends itself well or to quantitative process. That's what I kind of inferred from your earlier? My interests so far in Bitcoin have been as the underlying technology. I think at a technological level, it's a totally amazing. It's amazing that you can have hundreds of billions of dollars of exchanged every day without recourse to any sort of legal system, without banks involved and so on. And it's all done via, you know, sort of a very clever setup of uh, incentives. 
right? Everyone is incentivized to us uh, to sort of do the right thing. So on, at, at that level, I, th- I think it's amazing. And as an academic, I think there's lots of interesting questions to ask in terms of how does the, you know, the system work? Can it work better? So, I mean, you know, th- there's a number of issues, right? So it's amazing that it works, but it's, you know, wildly inefficient. Right. If you look at how much money is it costs to operate the Bitcoin system in terms of what is paid to miners, you know, the sums are, are, are staggering. Right. And so, you know, could we do that better? Like how does the system operate or, you know, so on. So I think that's one question, one thing that are interesting. I think another thing that's, uh, that's quite interesting and f- from my perspective, academically more recently is this what people call the DeFi space, decentralized finance where you have um, financial products which have emerged, which are sort of quite different and have a very different flavor. And so, for example, typical market structure in, you know, traditional markets, equities, futures, you know, sort of whatever is a centralized electronic uh, limit order, right? That's the way most markets are organized in the this sort of decentralized finance world. That kind of model doesn't work. If you're um, on a blockchain, you're in an environment where computation and so on is very kind of constrained. And, you know, you can't have people like inserting all these orders and canceling them and, you know, so on, right? So the kind of structure that's emerged there in terms of ways these assets that do not involve exchanges and are completely decentralized are these things called automated uh, market makers. So maybe you've heard of things like uh, Uniswap or so on. They're kind of organized quite differently, and I think they're not understood. And so I think there's, it's super interesting to me to sort of think about that. And, and so I think, you know, again, from an academic perspective, crypto and blockchain, it's interesting at many levels, right? At the lowest level, like how do these things operate? Who is paid what? How do we know they're secure? You know, so on and so forth. Lifting up a bit, you start to see differences in that those kind of, you know, markets, blockchain oriented markets, they're because of, you know, they operate at the nature of blocks, they're fundamentally discrete. So in, in most financial market, time is more or less continuous. You can cancel your limit order at any instant in time, right? But in uh, if you're operating in a uh, automated market maker, let's say on the Ethereum blockchain, in Ethereum, a block is generated, let's say every 10 seconds, right? So it's kind of like time is discrete. That's sort of fundamentally different. Computation and storage and so on, again, on the blockchain are very restricted. So, you know, at an even higher level, the completely decentralized markets are organized differently. So I think there's a lot of uh, sort of interesting things there. Now, so that's just, you know, me being interested interested as an academic. Taking the perspective of trading in these markets, I found that a little bit more more challenging because I think there's a lot of issues related that, that we don't think about in like, let's say you're trading equities, things like uh, counterparty risk and regulatory risk and so on. And, you know, um, so, some of these things are kind of so complicated, um, these uh, the decentralized mechanisms, you know, people sort of talk about a money like goes, but, you know, at the end of the day, you have sort of an incredible complexity and it's sort of hard to sort of reason about them. So you know, I've been, um, this is all very roundabout way of, I've been sort of more interested in sort of understanding what's going on and coming up with models to sort of what's what's the right way to think about some of these products, which I think we don't have yet, as opposed to sort of thinking of these as, as, as something to actively trade. They're, they're really quite different. And um, I'm not sure everything I know about quantitative trading and, you know, equities and futures and so on maps over to uh, to that space. So yeah, no, there's also really good points that you made there. Yeah, it really does feel like this is a, you know, a true innovation in the system. It's, it's quite revolutionary in many ways. Another question I wanted to ask you um, as we kind of round off our sort of conversation on, on finance is, you know, what qualities do you look for in somebody you were to hire into a fund in the quant space? You know, because obviously there's been big advances in computing and so on. You know, you, you have kind of the finance crowd, you have the maths crowd, engineering, computing sort of guys. I mean, what qualities do you look for if you were to sort of hire people into, you know, a quant fund? That's a tough one. I mean, I think at a certain level, you need a mathematical sophistication. But if you have someone who's too mathematical, that can actually sort of uh, inhibit your, your your thinking and make things too too sort of rigid, if you will. I think there's, there's sort of different kinds of roles, but maybe like the most common role would be like sort of a quant researcher. I think you almost want an experimentalist. It's almost like you have somebody doing physics or chemistry, they're doing experiments, and they're being very careful and coming up with, you know, sort of theories, hypotheses, trying to prove or disprove them, except the experiments are not in a lab, but are, you know, know, computational and, and, and sort of data oriented. So obviously, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying go out and hire a, a chemist, but I think you want that kind of research mentality, someone who's sort of very careful and, you know, has and is organized and thoughtful in the way that they do research. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I what I found when I've worked with quants or hired quants is the, the risk of having somebody who's 
from a very theoretical background, when you put them into kind of a quant role, it often that at least all sorts of challenges. And so on paper, and in reality, they are very smart, but it's a different type of smart that doesn't sort of lend itself as well to messiness of market sometimes. Yeah. And I think, again, computational side is more and more important. So if, if you have some guy who's, you know, sort of guy or gal, I should say, who's very sort of mathematically oriented and solid and so on, but they're just less facile with, you know, quickly iterating and trying a bunch of things sort of computationally, you know, that person is going to be at a disadvantage. So I think increasingly, and even, you know, putting aside the quant thing, even, you know, at, at Columbia, when we admit PhD students now, PhD students we select for are, are mainly very mathematical. The papers they're going to write are have a large theoretical component and there's, you know, theorem proof tiles style stuff and so on. But it's becoming increasingly important to have that, you know, sort of computational skill, because a lot of what guides the theory is being able to iterate computational experiments, right? And I think it's the same in, in the quant space. I think it used to be that you could sort of be sort of a bright undergrad and, you know, maybe not even in a quantitative major, but just sort of be quick on your feet and get hired at a place like, you know, D.E. Shaw or, you know, sort of a, a, a whatever, right? But, you know, now, you know, sort of what I see is, and I, I don't know if this is the right thing, but this is the, the people are getting hired. Not only do you need a much more relevant experience, like a, a quantitative degree, but also things relevant to sort of probability and optimization and so on. But in many cases, you know, they're, they're going after people who have specific, you know, finance work, like maybe you've done a research problem in quantitative finance, or maybe your advisor was someone like me who, who sort of works on those problems. So I think that space has started to become very competitive and specialized. And it, it, 20 years ago, that was not the case. No, that's true. And just now kind of on a more sort of personal level, I, I like to ask a few personal questions as well. You know, one question I'd like to ask is how you manage your informational research, you know, flow, because presumably, you know, you're actually, you straddle lots of different worlds. So there's papers being thrown at you all, all the time. You probably have your own research and there's financial news coming through all the time, new techniques that discover new data. I mean, how do you kind of manage and curate all of that? My number one piece of advice would be to write things down, take lots of notes. I have dozens of research notebooks, both for my academic work and my practitioner work. You sometimes have these sparks of inspiration and it's easy to sort of forget about that and so on. So, you know, again, different people have different processes. Maybe you use text files on your computer. I like, you know, written notebooks and so on, but try to sort of capture ideas and then sort of revisit them. In terms of uh, incoming information flow, um, this is a big challenge. And, you know, I, I don't know that I have a good answer and, you know, I've managed it well. I mean, on, on, on the one hand, let's say I have uh, um, interest in things like uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchain. This area is evolving so rapidly that in order to be relevant, you have to be sort of see where are things at now because maybe the thing you thought was interesting six months ago, nobody cares anymore. And it turned out not to be a good idea and the, the market has moved on, right? On the other hand, my experience, if you ingest too much information, then there, there's a chance a lot of that is noise and you get confused. Also, there's a chance that your ideas end up being just too conventional right? Because you're sort of being pushed by the same environmental drivers as other people. So that's not a satisfying answer. There's a trade-off and I, I, I don't know how to handle that. Yeah, no, no, there's uh, all, all reasonable points you make there. And then finally, I'm a big reader of books. And so is there any book or books that have really influenced you in the way you think about markets or quantitative finance? So let me give three books. I think the, the first two books are academic books, which are more just sort of methodology oriented, but I think uh, talk about the right uh, methodology. The first book would be The Elements of Statistical Learning by Friedman, Hasty, and Tib Shirani. So it, I think it's a, a practically oriented book on different types of statistics, machine learning, uh, you know, sort of uh, whatever, in terms of the pros and cons of some of these different methods. How do they work? Talk about things like overfitting and, you know, so on. So I think, you know, on the predictive modeling side, I, you know, maybe that's the most important thing. In terms of thinking of the control side, like how do you make decisions? There's a, a series of two books called Dynamic Programming and Optimal Control, Volumes 1 and 2 by Dimitri Bertsikas at MIT. And in terms of, you know, that being one of my research areas, this area of dynamic programming, I think those books give a lot of mathematical intuition of, you know, when you're thinking about, you know, making a decision now, for example, do I put this trade on? You know, how can I understand what future consequences of that decision are? And then lastly, I think the, I've you know, read a lot of uh, practitioner books as well. The book that's been most influential for me in, in terms of way I think about the markets is Active Portfolio Management by Grinold and Kahn. I think that captures a lot of this sort of scalable decomposition approach I talked about in terms of giving intuitions of, you know, building predictive models, the, the portfolio construction side, how do you think about transaction costs, 
important concepts like, you know, sort of information ratio and, you know, sort of things like that, you know, diversifying over time, diversifying over space, you know, uh, so on. So it's a little bit old now, but that would be my go-to in terms of thinking about how to sort of philosophically think about quantitative trading. No, no, that's really good. And uh, we've had a lot of food for thought in this conversation, a lot to learn. And if people wanted to follow your work, what's the best place for them to go to see, see your work? They can follow me on Twitter. I'm at CIAMAC, C-I-A-M-A-C, my first name. Also, my uh, website is molemi.com, M-O-A-L-L-E-M-I.com. I'm the only CMAC Molemi on the internet, so not hard to find. <laughs> yeah, I have to admit, I did have to ask CMAC how to pronounce his name earlier as, 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 as well. So yeah, I do imagine you're a, a, a very unique name. So with that, just uh, thanks a lot. It was an excellent conversation I had with you. And I look forward to seeing more of your work and, and staying in touch, hopefully, as well. It was fun to be on. Thanks for listening to the episode. Please subscribe to the podcast show on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave a rating and let other people know about the show. Also, sign up to become a member to our research at macrohive.com. We'll be back soon, so tune in then.